Welcome to the Ricky Matthews Show, where we celebrate every single day from the Citizens Bank Studio, the amazing people that are making co coastal Mississippi, the Delta, Jackson, and all over Mississippi a better place to live, work, and play. You know, we are, we, this is Thursday, so this is the expanded show. I want to welcome our listeners from the Delta market and from the Jackson area as we continue to celebrate this, this amazing place. Hey, listen, one of the great things about having this show, and as I've said before, I've had the opportunity to have more than 900 conversations, is that I have been introduced to so many great people, people who have been on the show or listeners that have engaged with me. It's been, it's been a lot of fun, telling great stories. Along the way, uh, I had the opportunity more than once to have a conversation with my dear friend, Louis Scrametta. You know the Scrametta family because they are... Uh, involved in the Ship Island excursion. So no matter where you are in Mississippi, if you've been to the coast, chances are you've been on a Ship Island boat headed to Ship Island. The Scrametta family is uh, very, very special to, uh, to coastal Mississippi and their commitment, not just to Ship Island and the preservation of Ship Island, but really the, the focus on preservation of the Mississippi Gulf Coast and this incredible natural resource we have in, in coastal Mississippi is special. It's special their leadership they provided, and that the family heritage is really a great story. Um, along the way, though, sort of really unrelated to that, one of one of my listeners, uh, his name is Robert Scrametta, uh, and I began sort of conversing back and forth. He spends time in the Mississippi Delta. He loves the Mississippi Gulf Coast. He happens to be um, Louis Scrametta's son, but. That's not really what connected us. What connected us, he was, he, was a, he was a listener of the show, and he heard me talking about a wide variety of topics across Mississippi, and we just chatted. One of the things he enjoys doing, incidentally, is, is uh, photography, and he's got a drone, and he's a drone pilot, and has drone footage of all kinds of landscapes across Mississippi. It's fascinating, some of the stuff that he sent me along the way. Well, anyway, we got to, we, we, you know, we continue our conversations and uh, I decided ultimately to invite Robert to be a part of this show because he is an interesting guy. He's actually a bank examiner in his day job, but he's someone who loves uh, he loves Mississippi, and uh, he's just an interesting guy. Went to Ole Miss, and uh, someone that I'm really looking forward to just chatting with this morning. So let me uh, let me bring in my good friend, uh, uh, my friend of my friend Louis Cremetta's son. Robert Scrametta, who incidentally I should also point out is a commissioner on coastal Mississippi tourism, which is something I'm super passionate about. So without any further ado, how you doing, Robert? Doing great. Thanks for having me on. It's good to see you. Where are you sitting right now? I'm at my house on Bayou Bernard in coastal Mississippi. There, there you go. There you go. So look, this, this, uh, we're going to tell a little bit of the story of your family and the pull that's always been on you to get into the family business. But you, you, you may eventually, but you, uh, you went to Ole Miss and ultimately became a bank examiner. I think you married someone from the Delta, right? That's right. I married the uh, lovely Dr. Hannah Gwynn. She's from Greenwood. Uh, born, she was actually born in Glendora, Mississippi, on a cotton farm. Ended up moving to Greenwood uh, in her kind of teen years. Went to high school in Greenwood and graduated. We we ended up going to Ole Miss together, and then kind of reconnected after college. Started dating and got married. And so that that relationship is so. Go ahead, go ahead. Small world because our mothers actually graduated high school together. And, oh uh, wow! Yeah, wow. That that's interesting. But uh, that, that relationship brings you – well, that in the banking business brings you back into the Delta on a pretty regular basis. Yeah, huh? yeah. so I'm in the Delta quite a bit. Uh, it's one of my favorite places to visit in Mississippi. It's one of our three national heritage areas, uh, including the Gulf Coast and North Mississippi Hill Country, another beautiful part of our state. Um, so, yeah, I, it, and just, you know, the, the, the Delta is a, a, a photographer's just kind of a dream. The horizons and the, the flat landscape, the row crops, the old houses, the river, the love, you know, you name it. it it's, it's, and it's just a eclectic group of people and just very welcoming and well-dressed people up in the Delta. The great, great clothing stores, you know, the Abrahams and the uh, just the, the nice places to shop and eat throughout the Delta. It's just a pleasant place to hang out. And uh, Yeah, I, I agree. Five and 45 minutes to have a drink in the Delta or go have dinner. And uh, that's kind of the norm to go eat doughs and then go have a drink at, at the Alluvian afterwards in Greenwood. And so, 
that's that's been my experience in the Delta, and I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, I started, I've been hunting in the Mississippi Delta for over 20 years, well, actually well over 20 years, and um, and then eventually started leasing farms for, for hunting purposes and really met so many amazing people through 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 that that history. And, you know, I fell in love with it. I mean, the, literally the first time I went to the Mississippi Delta, I fell in love with the Mississippi Delta. For, first of all, being from the coast and not having been there before, it felt like I was going into a different country. It's and a then different I, world. It's a different world. Yeah, and, and, and the other thing is the people. I mean, the, certainly the diversity is what makes it special. But uh, but I haven't met anyone in the Delta who was not welcoming, and it doesn't matter who they are. Big connection with the Delta and the Gulf Coast. We were both threatened by high water. Um, I, you probably remember 2019, the floods down there in the South Delta. They, they basically didn't have a, a farming season because of the floods, and that was all high water and, you know, kind of lack of government action, not to get into politics. But um, – and then they're also threatened by the weather from – economic standpoint, if they have a bad weather year, their crops might get ruined, whatever it is. They they live and die by the weather just like us, it's especially the Ship Island excursion business. We live and die by the weather. As you know, it's been Katrina. Then the oil spill, we've recovered, you know, all from all those things. We rebound pretty quick, and the island is just so uh, resilient. It's amazing. You go out there on any after even after a big storm, and it looks just like a tropical paradise, like it always does. Um, well, listen, man, if there was a theme to this this, this show, it is resilience. Uh, you know, telling right. because you know what is it that when people come here from either to move here or do business here. They they sense something about us. Uh, some on my show have called it the secret sauce, whatever it is, something that's in the heart and soul of Mississippians that I think is bolstered, that's enabled, that's um, that's that's strong, and that is the sense of resiliency. The fact, and that's I think I think you're entirely correct. I've, I've I've talked about that before, that the coast has had to deal with the worst natural disaster in American history. You think about the floods and the Delta and what they've endured, what farmers have endured. Over so many years, that sense of resiliency is built into our DNA, and that's that's you know, at, you know when you wipe everything else away, you're reminded of what in life is really important. Your neighbors are important. Your family is important. Your place is important, and people see that in us, and they see this loyalty to this place and our love for this place, and I think that's what makes Mississippi so special. I I, I sense that you know even you you guys are in the business, uh, your family business, in the business of catering to people from all over the country. They have to note that when they when they meet people in your family and the people who work for your family. Yes, yeah, uh, we're all tied to the land. I mean, especially in the family business. I mean, you just come talk to my dad on any day he's driving the boat. He just, I mean, you'll get a history lesson. He should have been a history teacher. If he wasn't a boat captain, he should have been teaching history at Ole Miss because uh, he's just, it's, he's passionate about it. And it's a rich history. It's a lot to share. I don't know if you're aware, but, you know, Ship Island was the last location that the United States was invaded from. So the British landed there in 1815 and then went on to New Orleans. But, that was the last time the United States was invaded, right here, 12 miles south of Gulfport. Like, you don't learn that in Mississippi history. Not my, I didn't. So, um, well, as I, I, as I mentioned, in the early days of my boating, I, in fact, I remember I used to sit on Courthouse Road Pier when I was in high school and watch boats go by and say, I need to get a job one day that will enable me to own a boat like that. You know, that was kind of, I had to, that's what I was a goal setter my whole life. And, um, and you know, first boats could only get to Ship Island, so spent a lot of time getting to know Ship Island. But you've heard a lot of people tell that story, haven't you? Right, yeah, and, the, the, like, the Pan American Clippers, it's still it's still on the Gulf Coast. It's a landmark. I mean, and the Ship Island boat, like clockwork, uh, it's just out there every day. You can see it coming in. If, if it's not out there, something's wrong, you know what I mean? yeah. Uh, I can look out there and know that my dad's driving the boat. It's pretty cool. I can even call him on the VHF radio if, if I'm doing it to the letter of the law. You know what I mean? Off, off of my boat or talk to him via radio. It's uh. So it's it's interesting. So you um you you went to Ole Miss and you you know what what did you get a degree in? What brought what what's the thing that led you into the banking industry? So I was a finance major uh, at Ole Miss School of Banking. Shout out Ken Syrie, chairman of the School of Banking. Uh, 
But, you know, most people probably don't grow up thinking they'd be a bank examiner. I remember the way I got the job is Ken Syrie sent an email out, you, you know, apply, you know, kind of promoting this job opportunity. I applied for it, got the job. Um, and it was the first job I got out of college and it's been, a, it's just been a great career. Uh, great. I've traveled all over Mississippi. I did also did the job in California. So I was able to travel some in California and it's, it's been a very, uh, translatable skill and the networking opportunities have been just amazing. I've met all kinds of cool people along the way. And, you know, most bankers, if you're hired at a bank, you might not talk to the CEO ever, but in my case, that's generally the only person you're talking to at a bank. So it's yeah, so, first, so, first out of college. It's a cool gig. It, and, and the best part is, let me tell you this little secret. We get Fridays off. Let's do that. Yeah, let's do this. We've come back on the other side and we'll pick it up from right there. You want to do that? Okay. okay we, when we come back, we'll continue our conversation with Robert Scrimetta. He's a commissioner for coastal Mississippi tourism and a member of the Scrimetta family from the ship Island excursion. We'll see you right after this. From the Citizens Bank studio, we're talking with my friend Robert Scrimetta. His family is in the Ship Island excursion business here in coastal Mississippi. He's a bank examiner that takes him all over Mississippi. And in my conversations with him, he just has a very eclectic love of things. Uh, he's a photographer, both in terms of sort of still photographer and doing drone footage as well. And I've had the opportunity to look at some of his stuff. And it's just a wide variety of landscapes from Mississippi. Of course, you know, lots of beautiful coastal scenes, as you can imagine, but his love of the Mississippi Delta is well represented in the photography that I have seen that he has done. And we're going to get into how he got into the photography business here in just a second. But, um, you know, I was really thrilled when I heard that Lewis's son, Lewis Scrimetta, who is the, is the major principal of the Scrimetta family business, Ship Island Excursion, was going to be that you know Robert was going to be a member of the and a commissioner of the Coastal Mississippi Tourism effort. Um, I was I was so thrilled to hear that. How, how has that worked out for you so far? It's been really interesting. I'm trying to just kind of listen to the guys who've been on there a while. Some uh, some great uh, co commissioners we have. I'm um, uh, I'm one of the youngest ones on the on the committee. Um, and I'm just trying to listen right now. And then, you know, I want to impart my energy and some of the ideas that I've had just from my travels and around the world, really. I want to bring those to Mississippi because there's some there's I mean, we've got a great place to live down here. We know that. But there's still some opportunity, some low hanging fruit that we can really take advantage of. And it probably wouldn't cost a whole lot of money from what, what yeah. I'm just, you know, we can talk about that later. But, yeah. Uh, so it, yeah, it, so it's really, really important work that they do. It's one of the first yeah. major regional efforts we did after Hurricane Katrina, and uh, there have been some bumps on the road along the way that I've covered uh, in, in a significant way. But at the end of the day, I think Coastal Mississippi is having some of its better years uh, as we speak. I would agree, and we've got some some great people in there, kind of running the organization. Um, Judy Young, who I'm sure you talked to her. She's got oh, yeah. some, some great stats that she can she can provide, but it's, it, it's, the numbers are pretty impressive from the, from the coastal counties, what we provide in terms of revenue for state tax dollars and, and jobs that cannot be outsourced. And the tourism industry kind of has to stay here, those jobs. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, and it doesn't, uh, tourism does not appear to be going anywhere. It's people want to have fun. So Yeah. Well, when you consider so many of the people, not just for coastal Mississippi, for all of Mississippi, so many of the people that come here, come here in their car, it creates tremendous opportunities for us. Uh, it gives people the opportunity to visit different communities in coastal Mississippi. When you're in the Mississippi Delta, people are more inclined to go study the Blues Trail, for example, and you know right. the largest outdoor museum. You know, the whole system of trails that we have are just are brilliant. What a great way to inject right. people into the heart of Mississippi. Hey, listen, as you get older in your life, though, and you, th and you think about the perspective that your family has in tourism, in the history of coastal Mississippi, it's kind of humbling, I bet, to, to reflect on how important your family has been to coastal Mississippi. Yes. Uh, just thinking about my great grandfather and grandfather who's still with us, thankfully, Captain Pete. Shout out most, you know, he's kind of a landmark in himself. He was mentioned in the John Grisham book. You know, it's it, you go around the state, most people probably couldn't tell you who the lieutenant governor or governor is in a lot of cases, but they've been to Ship Island. They remember that fact. So when they when they learn that I grew up on Ship Island, they're like, Oh wow, you know, I went out there in the sixties. 
or you know the 50s or whenever it was since 1927 so yeah uh just a it, it's been cool and just a, a cool thing to talk about and I, I grew up in the business you know from a the age old enough to work through college really until i got a job uh my first job as a bank examiner I, I i took a job because i wanted weekends off so i could go to ship island and hang out on my boat but uh <laughs> it was a it was a really a fun place to grow up and 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 just be surrounded by that changing cast of characters that make up the, the ship Island family and just the employees and the park rangers. And it's, you know, ship Island is really Mississippi's only true national park from a, from a natural resources standpoint. Yes, we have the, the cannonball parks in Vicksburg and the Natchez trace, but from like a, a proper national park experience, a camping kind of experience, Horn Island, ship Island, Petty boy, those are our really only, that's our only real national park. Um, and, you know, the South, you kind of think national parks out West, the Yosemite's and the Yellowstone, but we've got one right here in our front yard. Yeah, I had uh, I had the opportunity, Robert, to uh, be the first chairman of the board for the Friends of the Gulf Islands National Seashore. Okay. And, and uh, working with George Slogan to rebuild the Ship Island Lighthouse. Oh, man. And yeah. to see, see that to fruition. My kids... And their uh, uh, Girl Scout and Boy Scout troops actually went out and, and cut the trees down that became the legs of the of the of the uh, of the Ship Island Lighthouse. Oh, of I course, you know that that's the, the, they were pine trees from Mississippi. Yeah, oh yeah, they they came from uh, uh, the national park here in, in uh, uh, trying to remember the small town, but just north of here. Okay. And they were they were virgin uh, pines, and. Um, uh, we, you know, we we worked with a company to to actually mill those. Had to have special equipment because they were so long. And then we worked with CBs, and you know, this was a real mission of I George remember, Logos. I remember CBs yeah. going out there. I was a probably seventh grade. I want to say I remember that though. So yeah. I ran into you as a little. It, kid. it was a, quite a deal, man. We got it finished, and then as you know, not long after we got it finished, here comes Katrina. Right. And uh, so you know, that's how ultimately the Ship Island Lighthouse became part of the Gulfport. Small craft uh, harbor uh, was just, you know, we realized that rebuilding it out there was not really the right thing to do, you know. Yeah, we could talk about uh, island architecture and what survives. I mean, it's pro pretty obvious that Fort Massachusetts has survived, so maybe a round lighthouse would be a good. Uh, oh, right, right. Uh, no, I don't know, no. but you got to have a light out there. And, I mean, they do have the range tower, but uh, it's. Yeah. Uh, for sure. Hey, so um, what was it like? I mean, for along the way, you actually got a hundred ton uh, licensed boat captain because it's clear that maybe the trajectory might be that you'd be in the family business. So I, and, most yeah. of the family members that kind of grew up in the business, they all get their hundred ton. And any employee has the opportunity to really obtain that license. It's just a matter of obtaining the sea time and then doing the class. So, um, but so I got it. I've maintained it since about 2010. And uh, it's just, it's it's a cool thing to have and to know that you can go run a boat with, you know, paying customers on board and make some money with it if you need to. And, uh, but yeah, growing up on the island, man, what a place. My mom ran the snack bar when I was a little kid. So we would go out there and just stay all weekend. That was kind of our playground. She'd pick us up from school and we'd go out there. And so she's a photographer herself before the days of digital photography. She lost most of her pictures in Katrina, unfortunately, but she had quite a collection herself of photography. That was kind of what got me into photography. I was learning about shutter speeds in the second grade. So, um, and that, you know, through college, I always had a disposable camera with me. And uh, so I just maintain a love for, for photography. But moving back to Ship Island, yeah, it was just a cool place to grow up. And my mom would run the snack bar and we'd hang out with the park rangers and the lifeguards were our babysitters, basically. And it was just a it just a cool place. <laughs> and play hide and seek in the oh, yeah. Fort Massachusetts. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> what what else could you ask for? What what more can you ask for? Spent I spent so much time there. And then you know, hot the, dogs, nachos, and you know, all the soft drinks I could could handle. So it was great. You know, what's interesting is that, I mean, you mentioned you mentioned the algae bloom from the Bonnie Carey spillway, of course, Hurricane Katrina, but there have been uh, you know a lot of hurricane impacts because you know, what what what's important to know is that when you don't have a storm surge that goes over that actually goes over the island, um, the Ship Island Pier where the boats. A dock can can weather some storms pretty significantly, but if you have a storm that passes 
uh, to our east, then the north wind blows unbelievable waves toward that pier. And so that pier has had to be rebuilt a number of times. But that, that has created major challenges along the way, hasn't it? Yes, it has. And uh, so my grandfather, before the Park Service was involved, rebuilt that pier himself with the Pan American Clipper. That was their dredge. And they had a fire pump. They would, you know, hose down the pilings and do it themselves. And it's, I mean, that's what to be expected. It's just, it's, it's, it's going to happen. And uh, so you got to make it to where it's just, you know, expect to replace some planks every now and then. The Park Service has done a good job with that pier, I would say. They've got the through flow decking out there now. Which we'll see. There's no such thing as hurricane proof, in my opinion. But we'll see how this stuff works, and uh, it's it should be interesting. But they do a good job uh, trying to get that pier rebuilt when they can, and uh, or when it needs to be done. And uh, it's it is what it is. It's yeah. All and the people people continue to go there in droves. What's been interesting too about your family business, the the Ship Island Excursion business has been the way your your family has diversified. So it's not just anymore about going to Ship Island, but it's also about, you know, taking dolphin cruises and dinner cruises and stuff like that. That's been that's been a good a good important part of your business, hasn't it? Absolutely. The dolphin cruises especially is like I never get tired of seeing dolphins. And I mean you see plenty of dolphins just on their way to Ship Island, but it, it's fun being able to get on that boat for an hour and a half, and you go through the port too, which is really fascinating. The port of Gulfport is, is fascinating over it there. It is. But, you know, those ships are coming from West Africa and dropping off Ilmenite ore and going back to Africa right here in Gulfport. It's like wow. yeah, it's so it's so neat. It's so neat. Hey, listen, when we come back, we're going to continue our conversation with okay. Robert Scrimetta. He's a bank examiner. He works. Uh, his family started the Ship Island Excursion. It's a multi generation business. And uh, But he travels across the state. He spends time in Delta because he married a Delta girl. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that and his love of photography when we come back. We'll see you after this break. From the Citizens Bank Studio, uh, I, want to, uh, I want to continue this incredible conversation with my friend Robert Scrimetta, who is uh, he's actually a commissioner on Coastal Mississippi Tourism. He's a bank examiner. He travels all over the state of Mississippi. He married a Delta girl. He loves photography. And he's just an interesting guy, somebody I've really enjoyed getting to know better and someone I've been uh, have enjoyed uh, staying in touch with. Uh, so, Robert, coming back to you. So along the way, though, you mentioned your mother sort of introduced you to photography. But uh, you know, as you continue to sort of get up in your years, you've, you've really kind of doubled down on that, haven't you? Yeah, I have. I, I, when I was traveling around the state in my uh, in my duties as a bank examiner, I was like, I got to start taking pictures of this stuff. This is this this state's just too cool, too photogenic not to take photographs of. Fell in love with Main Street, Mississippi, really, because I got to see Main Street. You don't see it from the interstate usually, but if you if you go to the the bank's headquarters, those are usually in downtown. So I've been able to see all these cool little towns in Mississippi that I never even heard of before. But uh, so I got a camera. Um, the camera's been great, but I, I, what's really been fun is the drone. And the drones have just become so like accessible in the last couple of years. You go to Best Buy and buy a professional camera quality drone and put it up in the air, and it's a whole different perspective. Especially in the Delta, you see these row crop fields and catfish ponds and farms, and just the river itself, tugboats and. Uh, it's just been amazing. It really prompts a lot of questions in my own head. And so I've just kind of gone down the road of reading all these books about the Delta. There's a great literary history in the Delta, especially, and, but through all throughout Mississippi. So lots to read about and learn about. Um, and uh, it, it's it, it's amazing the impact that that river has had on this, the Mississippi River I'm talking about specifically has had on the state and just it's, it's, it's significant. I don't know if you're aware of this, the Mississippi River is the world's largest capital generating asset. So it's cheap transportation, a super highway effectively for all those farms along the river going up to, to Nebraska effectively that can get their goods to market really cheap. And, uh, and that has just been kind of the backbone of the state. People don't realize it because uh, in fact, a lot of those counties are the poorest counties in the state per capita. So it's just a, it's a weird kind of situation uh, 350,000 people approximately from Memphis to Vicksburg in this one geographic area where everybody's kind of aligned with big ag. The doctors, yeah. the doctors are 
serving farmers. The CPAs are serving farmers. The, the restaurants are usually serving farmers. And it's all about agriculture in the Delta, and it's serious, it's serious business. Yeah, good- there's, there's, there's no doubt about that. Hey, listen, one of the things I talked about on my show uh, last week, or this is my Super Talk Outdoor show, was the fact that one of the trends when they're looking at migratory birds, one of the trends they've seen is that uh, geese that that used to really uh, migrate down to South Louisiana have made a, sl- a shift into the Mississippi Delta area. So we see more geese there than we've seen yeah. in a long, long, long time. Have you successfully launched a drone yeah. into some geese? Yes, I have. Uh, check out my Instagram at robert.scrimetti. You'll see me flying with some geese. But it was, I was driving down Highway 61, as you know, the famous Blues Highway, which the reason Highway 61 is where it is, it, it parallels Deer Creek, the famous Deer Creek of the South Delta. So that's where all those kind of settlements along the river kind of developed. So the highway, highway 61 goes right through that, which is effectively the most fertile part of the most fertile part of the United States. So the Mississippi Delta is arguably the most fertile land in the world, and that southern part of the Delta is the most fertile part of that. So anyway, the ge- that's where I've seen all the geese. Just I'm talking about hundreds of thousands of geese just flying. And really, it's probably a negative in terms of other waterfowl because they're eating all the, the leftover corn or soybean or rice that's been in the fields. And I hadn't seen hardly a single duck. I don't. I don't know about you and your experience the last couple of weeks up in the during duck season. But my expectation is this recent cold snap that's happening in right now in Mississippi, but it's been happening in, up north. Is going to push those waterfowl down. Probably be a great hunting time in February. <laughs> no, not not hunting season for waterfowl, but it's it's great photography season. Duck yeah. photography wide open in February. So so you successfully launched a, a drone into a flock of geese? Yes. Yeah. I'll, I'll send you the video and y'all can post it. But uh, it was cool, man. So those geese, my drone goes 45 miles an hour, so it keeps right up with those geese. And uh, uh, it, it, you, you can, you see them right here in Gulfport, Le- or a big lake right up in uh, the Shutica Buff River area of Biloxi. There's tons of geese back there. I've flown with them back there. You'll see flocks of geese flying around. It's it, yeah, and a drone gets right there in it, and it's just a cool perspective. Uh, <laughs> so that's so neat. Hey, so in, in your travels, again, you've seen it all, and, and Mississippi is defined by its landscapes. You know, the flat li- lands of the Mississippi Delta, the hills of Northeast Mississippi. There's so much to to Fine. brag about and enjoy. Yeah, it's we've and and it, you know, really the the agricultural history history of the Delta is. Is, is kind of young in terms of some other agricultural history in the state. I, you're probably aware of, of the, the Mississippi Black Belt or the Black Prairie, which is kind of the, the Golden Triangle, part, West Point area kind of part of the state. That was where a lot of the uh, plantations and stuff initially were, that, but that soil was exhausted. So the planters moved into the Delta. They, they started building their own levees, and then the 1927 flood happens. They put the big levee in, and um, so it's, yeah. It's, hey, so, so in your travels, is there? As, as, let's think about it from a perspective of a, of a photographer. Is there is there some special moment in your photography time that you've just caught a moment that you thought, "Wow, I'm sure you caught a bunch of moments like that." But is there one that stands out? Oh gosh, it's 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 probably been in Mississippi, either in the Delta or over over Cat Island. Just once you get a drone in the air and you see that kind of the the network of waterways that makes up Smuggler's Cove, for example, it's just mind blowing. It's like, what? This is our backyard. Yeah, and, yeah. Like, oh, I know one that's been really cool is drive as far southwest of Mississippi as you can. It's it's Hancock County, but it's called Ainsley, Mississippi, on a map. I don't know if you're familiar with La France Marina, no. you, that area, but it, it's past Perlington, or I'm sorry, past. Uh, where the silver slipper is, yeah. But uh, yeah. you go, just keep driving. There's a, you put a drone in the air, and there's a railroad track. It's surrounded by some type of, of wetlands redevelopment. But it looks like a waterfront neighborhood that just never got developed. But the grid work is just mind blowing. I posted it on my Instagram. You can check it out. But uh, I'll send you that picture as well. Because and I've asked like uh, environmental lawyers and stuff like what what the heck is this and over here is this some type of wetlands redevelopment and it, it's just. It's really cool from the air. So aerial Mississippi is kind of a uh, is a is 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 interesting. 
Uh, it, it, re it really is interesting. You know, I bet um, you mentioned, you know, about, about Ship Island being resilient, but it is amazing. You think about all the twists and turns, the Camille cut, not a Camille cut, and then a cut again, and all the all that has gone through the, the east side of the island, having the, the, the pines decimated in Katrina, and then the way it kind of resiliently starts to come back again. Yeah, I mean, you've been able to watch a lot of change there, haven't you? I have, and uh, you're right. I mean, Ship Island, of all the islands, it appears to have taken the biggest beating and just, I mean, Camille cut. It, but it wants to build back as the, you know, and before Katrina, you remember, you could swim from East Ship Island to West Ship Island. And so it's it naturally wants to heal itself. And I think, you know, filling in the cut was a good thing. I hope it, I hope it can survive. I hope we can get that, you know, the, the neck is what it's formally called on a map now, that, that Camille cut area. I hope we can keep that uh, above water for the next storm for lack of yeah. a better time. I Hey, so along the way, you also got involved in fossil hunting. How did that become a hobby? Oh man, that's 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 so Mississippi. The Mississippi River is it's mostly privately owned land, so you need permission before you do this. So make sure you talk to the landowners owners and check where you're doing it. But like bridges, for example, underneath bridges are probably a good place to start. Those are usually public places. But yeah, the the when the Mississippi River is low, it exposes these gravel gravel beds which is where the fossils end up. And you can find, you know, Pleistocene era type fossils, which is, I, I don't want to mess this up. You'll just have to Google it, but it's a long time ago. But back when <laughs> and stuff, we're still roaming the South. And the uh, there used to be an ocean that cut, that went all the way up to like, I, I want to say Atlanta somewhere. It just, it was the, the a, a, some sea, that, an inland sea that came through here. And there's, there's a great archeologist, if you're interested in this name, James Starnes, and you can Google him on Facebook, but he's Mississippi's, he's, he's associated with the Mississippi agency, but he is just an expert on any, if you have a picture of an arrowhead or a tooth that you found he can tell you exactly where it's from and what you know what the history of it so it's been a good resource just kind of learning about these things and you know where these indian villages were on the river and you, you hear about all these arrowheads being found in farmers fields it's like how do they lose so many arrowheads it's like what well, <laughs> you no know, but the reality is they that they're finding them in these places that were like villages where they were just making hundreds of thousands of arrowheads and it, you know so you're gonna yeah. find Oh, yeah, we had a we no had uh, there was a there were two areas in a farm that I used to lease. I had it until last year, and we we made a change in, on one of our farms. And uh, man, it had a lot of arrowheads. Um, there was a there was one of our one of our food plots. We called it Grand Canyon. So we had 500 acres up actually up in the hills. And you know when you look at the rocks, they're all rounded off, and you start to begin to contemplate how did this alluvial plain become what it became? And right. it, and then you you say, gosh, man, this there's some drastic drastic geological uh, conditions that created the the uh, the Mississippi Delta. It's amazing to think about that and contemplate it. Hey, when we come back on the other side, we'll continue our conversation with Robert Scrimetta. He's a bank examiner, part of the Scrimetta family and the Ship Island Excursions. Uh, anyway, we'll continue on the other side. Welcome back to the Ricky Matthews Show from the Citizens Bank Studio. And uh, again, welcome our listeners from the Delta and the Jackson Market. And one of the things that I've actually posted about this, I I'm really interested in finding people who aren't looking for necessarily for public attention, but who are working in the trenches, who are doing cool work. It might be in a nonprofit. It might be entrepreneurial. It might be they have a cool hobby. It might be they're just an interesting personality, someone that that we ought to introduce to the to the rest of Mississippi. If you know someone like that, get in touch with us and let us know who that person is. Um, Robert uh, Scrametta, whose family started the Ship Island Excursion business here in coastal Mississippi, he's actually a bank examiner in Mississippi and travels all over the state. He's also a member of the, uh, the Board of Commissioners for Coastal Mississippi Tourism. And someone I've enjoyed uh, getting to know, just an interested listener. In fact, he's a terrific photographer. And me coming from the publishing uh, arena, I can appreciate the work that he's doing. And, and in fact, mentioned to him off the air that I'm going to introduce, introduce him to JT Mitchell so that JT can have access to some of his uh, photography that he takes as he travels across the state of Mississippi. Just interesting stuff. You know, Robert, coming back to you, though, you, you're a member, the youngest member uh, the Board of Commissioners for Coastal Mississippi Tourism, this regional organization for the three coast counties of uh, of coastal, Missi coastal Mississippi. 
Um, so you bring a kind of a young perspective to the to the conversation, and I would bet that whatever observations you have about where coastal tourism can go would really apply to the rest of the state. But so from a sort of a, a youthful perspective, um, where do where do you see tourism headed? It's headed in the right direction for sure right now. Um, you know, we've got a resilient tourism industry down here, and our contributions to the state are significant. I mean, we contribute the lion's share to the state's tax revenue. Um, you know, I, I want to make the Gulf Coast uh, uh, just, you know, enhance what we already have. There's some natural resources, some low-hanging fruit, for lack of a better term, that we, we are utilizing it, but I think we could add add to it. Uh, bike lanes, I would say, are a big thing. I don't. Do you know the guys at Biloxi Bicycle Works? He's been. He is. Oh yeah, he's been. He's been on my show many times. He and great I, Gulf Coast resource, and just yeah. his, uh, you know, his kind of vision for bike lanes is is one thing I would like to see. Whether it's you know a, a serious bike lane put on Pass Road that kind of unifies Biloxi and Gulfport with a you know a ten mile bike commute, an easy pleasant bike commute because as you know driving down highway 90 it's it's it, it is cool but having cars zooming past you is not necessarily the most pleasant thing all day long so there's some different routes we could take you know to kind of unite the gulf coast via bikes i think the railroad tracks are another possible corridor we could kind of you know uh, dial in on um i would like to see just a you know better public resources whether it's a skate park for kids who aren't necessarily interested in playing baseball for eight years in a row without something else to kind of do because as you know mississippi doesn't have a lot of places to go skiing but we have a lot of athletic people that would probably be great at sports that would complement going snow skiing like skate skating or rollerblading riding a bike, uh, just outdoor exercise in general. That's not a competitive sport necessarily that people can kind of ease into and uh, enjoy alone um, and into their adulthood. Because as you know, most most adults don't really play baseball or football. So what are you going to do when you're 40 and you're bored? So I think a bicycle is a great way to start. Bike lanes, you know, get on the bike, go have coffee, breakfast, hit the Waffle House if you want. Um, we've got plenty of those, no doubt, but, uh, anyway, that's, that's one, you know, just a healthy lifestyle, promote that and outdoor activities. Cause you know, we're... Robert, you think, see, I think a great trend in coastal Mississippi that you see bits and pieces of, it of other parts of the state, but this whole notion of mixed use where you have restaurants, uh, co-mingling restaurants and other commercial business co-mingling with residential in a way that we're bringing residents back downtown to places like Ocean Springs and Bay St. Louis, lots of uh, big projects focused on Gulfport and, and Biloxi. You know, that young people want to live, work, and play in the same area. Exactly. And they don't need a big waterfront house. You know, they need they need efficiency. And that's just kind of the trend is a, fish, a place to keep your stuff, watch a movie, Maybe have a glass of wine and then go out and enjoy, you know, your, your bar and restaurant should be your kitchen or your, you know, you can cook at home sometimes, but go out and enjoy some fried seafood and some raw yeah. um, yeah. what it's a, it's a it's a great trend, and I, I think as you, as you will even understand even more as we go forward, one of the things that makes Coastal Mississippi so amazing is that not only is it, it a an economic engine for the rest of the state, but it's this collection of communities from Waveland to Moss Point and all points in between where each place has its own sense of place. But then you bring it all together in the diversity of those experiences as you go from one city to the next. That in itself is an attraction for coastal Mississippi, That both, both from a tourism point of view and in terms of a young person who might want to, to live here. So the more we can do mixed use and build residential downtown, the better it's going to be. I agree 100 percent. Living downtown just has it a whole nother energy and um, it just it makes everything more fun. Just Yeah, it does. It does. By cool. Main streets are hard to replicate that energy. Yeah, listen, Robert, we're, we're out of time. But listen, it's been a pleasure to, to visit with you. And I yeah. appreciate your your uh, sharing your experiences from traveling the state. I look forward to getting some of your photographer on the supertalk.fm uh, site. But it's been a pleasure, my friend. We'll stay in touch. Yes, sir. Thank you for having me on. This has been Robert Scrametta. Uh, I've really enjoyed this conversation. Have a great day, and we you will too. see you tomorrow. All right.